So we move now to the second video of the day. I really hope you enjoyed watching the video on placenta abruption. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Drop a like, drop a comment, grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's medical review series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series where you look at one medical topic in a clinical course in full depth. Today we're going to be looking at two topics. Imagine two topics in one lecture. So we're pretty much going to be looking at uterine rupture as well as vasa previa. Very, very short topics as we're continuing our lecture on antepartum hemorrhage. So remember that when it comes to uterine rupture, here you have complete separation of the walls of a pregnant uterus with or without expulsion of the fetus that endangers the life of the mother and or the fetus. Now remember that the rapture may actually be considered as incomplete where it's not going to be included in the peritoneum or it may be complete where it's going to be included in the peritoneum. Certain risk factors include a classical uterine incision. Now way back we used to make the uterine incisions as vertical on the uterus so we used to cut through the muscles so that was a very very rudimentary way of doing things and it actually placed the woman at risk 20 times more likely to have uh, a rupture of the uterus if they had a vertical incision that was in the fundus as opposed to a lower segment incision that is horizontal remember that the upper segment of the uterus or the upper half of the uterus is going to be contracting so if you made the incision there in the upper segment and the uterus began to contract, it means that these muscles that you injured way back and scar tissue formed, they could easily rupture. So maternal and perinatal, uh, perinatal mortality is actually higher with the vertical incision ruptures. You may also have other conditions like myomectomy, excessive oxytocin stimulation. Other risk factors include grand multiparity, marked uterine distension. Now, what are some of the clinical features that we'll see of women that have uterine rupture? You're going to be having vaginal bleeding. So this is one of the causes of antepartum hemorrhage. You have loss of the electronic fetal heart rate signal. You have abdominal pain and you have loss of station of the head. Then you are going to be pointing yourself towards uterine rupture. Then, of course, the rupture may occur actually before the labor starts. It may actually also occur during the process of labor. Now, how do we make a diagnosis? Usually, we confirm the diagnosis by surgical exploration of the uterus and we actually identify the scar. When we examine this woman, this woman will be in shock. She will have abdominal pains. There will be some free fluid and abnormal abdominal contour or uterine contour. You may have a tender abdomen. The fetal parts may actually be quite easy to palpate. That's if the, the fetus has actually even found its way into the abdomen. Then, of course, the maybe some absent fetal movements and an absent fetal heart. Then management is of course surgical, so you want to perform an emergency laparotomy. We want to repair the rupture if possible. If it's not possible, then we may perform a subtotal hysterectomy. So in cases of uterine repair, we usually counsel our patients that all subsequent deliveries are going to be done via C-section. Immediately someone has one episode of a uterine rupture. All other pregnancies must be done via C-section. Then, of course, immediate delivery of the fetus is quite imperative. On the other hand, we have to talk about vasa previa. Remember that this is bleeding from the umbilical vessels. Now, remember that in vasa previa, you have these vessels that are traversing over the internal cervical os. Now, remember that the, the bulk majority of these vessels are supposed to be covered by a special type of connective tissue, which is known as Watton's jelly. So they're not going to be protected by this Watton's jelly. Now, in most of the cases, the vasa previa may actually be associated with other uh, insertions of the, the umbilical cord 
into the placenta. Remember that the, the, the umbilical cord is supposed to be stemming right from the center, from the disc of the placenta. But in some cases, the umbilical cord may actually be arising from either an accessory lobe or a accentuate lobe, or it may be as arising from the uh, fetal membranes, which is known as a filamentous insertion of the umbilical cord. So this is coming from the membranes instead of the placental disc. Then of course, if these vessels are actually going to be ruptured, then the bleeding is going to be coming from the fetal placental circulation. So it may actually lead to exangiation of the fetus. The blood in the fetus could be completely drained and the fetus may actually die. So this is very, very dangerous for the fetus. Now here is normal cord insertion. As you can see, it's stemming from the placental disc. Here we have a filamentous cord insertion where we can see that the, the umbilical cord is now stemming and from the pretty much the membranes and you have some exposed blood vessels although these blood vessels are not running on the cervix so here the, there is no risk of vasa previa but on this case here where you have these blood vessels now traversing the cervix here there's a great risk of vasa previa especially when the membranes rupture then these blood vessels can, eject, can also rupture then here are the different placenta variations so we have a filamentous insertion over here where the the uh, fetal vessels are actually the umbilical vessels are arising from uh, pretty much your membranes you may also have a succinctuate lobe where you have an accessory lobe here that has some uh, blood vessels also traversing through the membranes over there then you have the different types of insertions like a battle door or a marginal insertion um, a circum uh, marginate you also have a circumvallate insertion and of course a bilobed these are different placenta variations. Keep these things in mind because they may bring you this on your OSCE stations and they may ask you to actually label these things. Then what are some of the risk factors and clinical features? So risk factors include the lamentous insertion of the umbilical cord, accessory placental lobes, and even multiple gestations. Now, what is the clinical triad that we usually see? So the first thing is that there's going to be rapture of membranes. So here I'll give you a typical history that there was a gush of fluid Later on, they followed vaginal bleeding. Remember that this bleeding is going to be painless. If you actually look at the fetal heart, it's going to show you fetal bradycardia. So rupture of the membranes, painless vaginal bleeding, and fetal bradycardia. So this is sometimes could be very, very difficult to distinguish between this on some questions between vasa previa as well as placenta abruption. Then, of course, the diagnosis and treatment diagnosis is of course determining whether this blood is coming from the mother or the fetus i already alluded to an apt test when i talked about placenta previa where we actually take one meal of the blood we add two to three drops of alkaline solution which is pretty much our potassium hydroxide if the red blood cells remain pink that means that they're resistant to the environment that have created these are most likely feed to red blood cells if they get hemolyzed and they actually turn brown the solution turns brown this is most likely maternal blood and of course there may be some vaginal bleeding with associated fetal distress tachycardia sinusoidal fetal heart tracing sometimes even bradycardia in most of the cases then of course complications you may have a bleeding which is at fetal in origin so there is fetal mortality in most of the cases there's going to be fetal exangiation where the blood is completely drained from the fetus so whenever you make a diagnosis of this it's always emergency cesarean section if the fetus is viable and of course you may have to transfuse the neonate with blood wherever needed i hope you really understood this last bit on the four important causes of late trimester bleeding as well as antipartum hemorrhage now in the last video that i'm going to release today we're going to look at pretty much the summary of antipartum hemorrhage so please stay tuned to that video watch it enjoy it my name is dr moses kazevo until next time bye bye